This week on Quality Digest Live, we chat with Chad Keimel of Omnex Systems about how software can help you achieve the goal of zero defects. That's right, plus improving communications during natural disasters. That more when we come back. This episode of Quality Digest Live is brought to you by Mitotoyo America. Whatever your metrology challenges, Mitotoyo supports you from start to finish. And welcome back to Quality Digest Live for October 13th, 2017. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief, Dirk Ducharme. So with all the talk recently about health insurance and health care recently, there was what I thought was a really, really interesting article in Hospitals and Health Networks website. Ho Hospitals and Health Networks. Uh, and the article was titled, How Healthcare Leaders Should Navigate Quality Reporting, written by Maggie Van Dyke. Really good article that focused on the issues facing doctors and hospitals when it comes to Medicare reporting requirements for something called value-based payment approaches to healthcare providers. And if you aren't familiar with value-based programs, we actually have talked about uh, them here on the show. It's been a while. These are, um, value-based programs are centers for Medicare and Medicaid services, CMS programs that reward healthcare providers with incentive payments for the quality of care mm. they give people with Medicare. Now, mm. as Van Dyke explains, value-based payment approaches, including Medicare's quality payment program, or QPP, which is for physicians and other uh, eligible clinicians, tie fees and bonuses to these doctors and clinicians to how well providers perform on various cost measures. Now, the assumption is that quality of care can be easily measured and reported. In reality, Van Dyke writes, these measurements are still kind of evolving. And while the idea of pay for performance in healthcare makes sense, it's kind of how a lot of other services work after all. You get paid for how well you do or sure. not paid at all if you do poorly. Uh, it only works if you are measuring the right thing. I and mean, we talk about this a lot. It doesn't matter whether you're in healthcare or anything. If you're collecting metrics or KPIs or whatever you want to call them, yeah. and you're not collecting light or the right ones, it doesn't do you a whole heck of a lot of good when it comes to improving what you're doing. Right, right, exactly. Okay, so now along with the burden of reporting and some technological issues with e-records, ele electronic health records, and ele electronic health reporting, her article points out a couple of problems with value-based payment programs in general. The first is that the metrics being reported are often related to process. Was a certain test done, for instance? as opposed to patient outcomes, <laughs> right? And I suppose in manufacturing terms, this can be analogous to, uh, uh, I don't know, did we build it to spec? Yeah. You know, as opposed to, was it what the customer actually, actually wanted, wanted or needed, right? right? right. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, you know, so I mean, I don't think any of us would argue that following a process, uh, you know, or meeting spec is important, but more important, is, is it what the customer or patient needs? So in the case of healthcare, are we measuring and acting on, are the doctors measuring and acting on, healthcare providers measuring and acting on, what will make the patient healthy or make the community healthy? So in many ways, says Van Dyke, uh, CMS's quality payment program is actually moving providers in that direction, moving them toward more meaningful quality measurement. Uh, for instance, QPP has two tracks. Uh, providers in the merit-based incentive payment system track only have to report on six quality metrics now and this is quite a few uh, less i mean it used to be like even dozens as yeah. from from what i've read and heard uh, so it's quite a you know six is quite a few less and also they are required to choose at least one outcome measure, so patient outcome measure. Uh, on another track, uh, providers that uh, participate in Medicare's advanced alternative payment model are tracking uh, both a number of outcome and population health focused measures. So in other words, uh, you know, slowly as they learn how to do this and understand what to collect and, and what really makes sense, they're moving away from simply process and looking at what are we actually accomplishing, 
accomplishing in terms of, of patient or community health. And actually on their web, website, Medicare has a great way of putting this. They're saying it's helping healthcare providers focus on care quality and the one thing that matters most which is making patients healthier. So in other words, yeah. collecting the metrics <laughs> yeah. that actually make sense. Mm -hmm. Now the second problem with these value-based approaches is interpreting metrics from one healthcare provider to another. So think of this as in our manufacturing realm, let's say, uh, you have uh, multiple, uh, 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 multiple um, audits. You know, you have you know uh, 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 an audit from one uh, from one vendor or one uh, one customer, and you have an audit from another customer, mm -hmm. and they're supposedly maybe looking for the same thing. Well, in the healthcare, then Van, uh, Van Dyke points out that different payers ask healthcare providers to report on what might seem to be the same thing, such as let's say tracking hemoglobin levels in patients with diabetes but the details often vary. Mm -hmm. So think of your two, two different second party audits, right? So for instance, one payer may define diabetes control as an A1C level below nine, while another defines it as being below eight, meaning one payer might think you're keeping your diabetes patients hemoglobin yeah. levels under control, while the other say, well, no, you're not. And of right. course, in a value-based <laughs> system, this is gonna have an effect on your payments, and right? You so, so yeah. you know, what are you doing? Now, one, one says, yeah, you're under control. One says, you're not. One's going to give you your incentive bonus. The other one's going to yeah. not going to do it. So it's a big deal. Yeah, it is. So to address that issue, writes Van Dyke, one healthcare system has created a standardized set of quality metrics for its employed and affiliated physicians, so that those doctors don't have to worry about different measurement requirements from Medicare and a different one from commercial insur insurers. So they've created one standard that everybody can agree on and you know, that makes a lot of sense. So mm -hmm. there's a lot more to this really well-written article. If you're interested in the problems and some of the solutions to value-based reimbursement, uh, take a read. I mean, w whether you're a, a healthcare provider or healthcare user, it's important to understand the shape that healthcare is taking because it affects it affects all of it. It affects what healthcare costs us as well. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, that's the whole idea, right? Yeah, interesting article. You know, as you're as you going through that, I thought about two quotes from different people that we, we quote a lot here. Um, Phil Crosby was the first one, I believe, who said that equality is conformist to requirements. And whose requirements? <laughs> right, 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 requirements, right, right, right. right? I mean, yeah. if you're gonna build a spec, I mean, it's gotta be built, built yeah. in what the customer wants. The other one was from our friend Davis Balistratu, who always says that you wanna make sure you're not measuring the wrong things better. You know? <laughs> right, I mean, right, yeah. right, right. We're really good at We're measuring really this good stuff. At measuring the wrong things. Uh, unfortunately, has nothing to do with what we with need what to do. With what we really right? need. So, yeah. I mean, those, you know, people yeah. have thought about this for a while. Uh, but by the way, the, the pay for perform, uh, the, the value-based payment thing in, in Medicare, and, yeah. and uh, it's still, it was very controversial when it came out. I think it's still somewhat, because it's still, it's still, I think, within the healthcare field, still kind of rankles that I'm having to report on, on stuff, but I, yeah. I think they're dialing it in, so where even the doctors begin, okay, well, if you're measuring this, now we're talking yeah, something that makes that sense. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah, getting doctors on board is always a hard yep. thing about that. Great, thanks, Derek, okay. Well, also in the news this week, the American Society for Quality is spotlighting an upcoming conference on innovation and technological advancement. That's good stuff. A new ASQ conference to help attendees thrive in climate of constant change is the name of this item, which appeared uh, late last month on the ASQ website, and we linked out to it in Tuesday's issue, issue actually of the Quality Digest newsletter. Uh, and the conference is called Quality 4.0, Summit on Disruption, Innovation, and Change. And it occurs next month, November 13th and 14th in Dallas, Texas. And you know, as the name would suggest, the event's gonna help quality professionals uh, understand and, uh, and kind of contextualize ongoing technological changes and things like you know, machine learning is a big thing, uh, Internet of Things several other important uh, technologies that people really should be aware of. And there's gonna be two important keynote speakers at the event, there, there are a couple of interesting people. The first is John McElliott, and he is the CEO and founder of York Exponential. Now York Exponential is a technology company that develops and leverages robotics, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. So he's always got some good things to say yeah. about this, this, uh, this item, uh, this, this, this topic. The second speaker is Rebecca Kowalski, and she's the vice president of Right Management, which is a manpower group company that uses forecasting and global cross-branded solutions to help lead clients through 
organizational transformation. So you're going to get one keynoter is going to talk about the kind of top level of technology, and the other one's going to talk about how you kind of you manage your way through that yeah, okay. to use it in, in what you're doing. Kind of good, good pairing there. Um, and you know, techn technological change is really everywhere these days, pretty much every job in every organization, certainly in our, our little business, has sure. been touched by disruption over the past decade or two, and, and I don't think we've seen anything yet, so <laughs> events like this one from ASQ help make sense of it all for those of us in quality. So for more information on ASQ's Quality 4.0, Summit on Disruption, Innovation, and Change, check out the story link just below this video player screen right down there, check it out. That's right, well you know, quality has come a long way. Come a long way, baby. Come a long way, baby, in the past. 40 years or so, and, right. and we, we have gone, really, uh, in those 40 years, from trying to inspect quality into our products to preventing them from getting there in the first place. And we've talked about, you know, way back when, you know, we used to talk about, oh, you know, rejects in the 10,000 yep. parts per, per right. million or 20,000 parts per million. And then we got down to, you know, rejects and, you know, maybe the hundreds of parts per million. And now there's companies out there that are measuring or, or reporting rejects in the parts per billion. Yeah. I mean, that's almost, that's almost Phil Crosby's Zero defects, well, practically. We, we talked about Crosby, <laughs> we, just we, talked about exactly. Crosby, you know? I mean, the we're getting really close. That's right. Uh, and there's there's a lot of methodologies that are, that are kind of contributing to getting down to this parts per billion rejects. And our next guest, Chad Keimel, wrote the article from percent rejects to parts per billion moving toward zero defects, which will appear in this coming Monday's, next Monday's uh, Quality Digest Daily. And in that article, uh, he explains a little bit about how we have moved from PPM or parts per million to uh, parts per billion. And Chad is with us now via Skype to talk about that. Hi, Chad. Hi, Dirk. Hey, I'm um, Mike. So just, I mean, just really cutting to the chase here. So. Briefly, how have companies moved from percent rejects or parts per million to really kind of phenomenally parts per billion rejects? You know, um, Dirk, it, it even came as a surprise to me. You know, so in this article and in the webinar we're going to do next week, I focus on disciplined new product development, then a very important tool, FMEAs, Third is the corrective action linking back into the uh, preventive action, which is the FEMA that we use to, you know, drive new product development. And, you know, I'd like to highlight one of my customers, a very large customer with something like 300 plants globally that were, you know, as you said, they were in 20,000 to 50,000 ppm. So this is one of the things I like to tell my current aerospace customers that if you stick to these processes, you know, a disciplined new product development process, the FMEAs, and linking back of tools like the AD or corrective action back into the FMEAs, there's a tremendous benefit. You know, there are other things that you also have to do, but in the article, I really focused on these tools. And just to you know, just to tell you a little bit about this, this customer that we've been working since 1995, you know, about 10 years ago, were under 100 ppm. Wow. And you know, and they, then they dropped to you know, the, the uh, VP of quality told me when I bragged because you know I was the president of the Semiconductor Assembly Council out out in um, Silicon Valley, and um, you know we had. Uh, assembly plants who make assembled chips be below 10 ppm. When I talked about it, then he mentioned to me how most of his plants were below 30 ppm. Fast forward to 2017, we're still working with them and they are in parts per billion. So it's not just one company. This is what we're finding with the high-tech companies we work with and the manufacturing companies we work with uh, using these tools. It, it, Ch Chad, I mean, that's pretty phenomenal. And I mean, if, if you could, if there was one thing you could point to that is, or maybe there isn't just one thing, or maybe a couple things. I mean, what would you point Actually, to to yeah. say what is the, the, the reason that companies have been able to get down to these, you know, parts per, per billion? Is, is there one thing in particular that they're doing, or is it a couple things that tie into all this? So what I'd like to maybe focus on the one thing is the FMEA tool. Of course, 
you know, this is where the software comes into play. And, and you know, use of software enabling the use of these tools. So I'm going to go into some technical jargon here, if you don't mind, mind Dirk. Okay. The design FMEA needs to link with the test plans. You know, so if, uh, design FMEAs are driven, so you look at the functions of the product, look, look at the failure modes of the product, I'm going to fast forward. And then you decide, you know, identify the important characteristics, critical and significant characteristics, and populate the process flow, PFEMA, control plan, and I call it risk-based work instructions. That single process done right will have immense benefit inside the organization. Then, you know, you have to take your corrective action and then make sure you take the corrective action and drive it back into the FMEA and to use the FMEAs which are family-based, product family, process family, and when you come up with a new product, you have to use that information for the new product. So this is how you know, they continuously reduce the PPM levels, and it works. And you know, if the healthcare industry used it, it would work again there. <laughs> exactly. So, Seriously. So Chad, how, how do field reports, things like field reports, customer feedback, how, do, how does that tie into the, the FMEA? All right, so I, I missed that part. It's a very good question. Really, you know, when we started doing FMEAs, and I, I, you know, I started doing FMEAs in 1985. 1985, Dr. Deming helped Ford Motor Company write 20 questions into a 20 question Q101 uh, you know, uh, standard, first two questions were FMEAs, okay? Well, FMEA and control plans. And we started by doing brainstorming. We brainstormed failure modes, not anymore. We learned maybe about 15, 18 years ago that you have to you know, look at real data, the warranty data, the field failures, internal scrap, you know, rework. Take a Pareto of it, and your teams, your cross-functional teams doing your design FMEA and the process FMEA have to use this real data in terms of looking at your failure modes. So those, you know, those failures are the failure modes, Mike. And then from there, you identify the effect of the failure, the cause of the failure, the preventive and detective controls, and then you drive to recommended action. I can tell you so many things everybody does wrong in these tools, but the great story is, despite all that, there's tremendous benefit that has come from this. And, and so, so Chad, I mean, so that makes sense. I mean, I understand about taking actual field data. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously this is how it failed. So let's let's tie that back in back. You know, this real data back into the process. But is there is there still value? in brainstorming failure modes that may not Potential. have happened yet. Yes. So, you know, and, and this, we, we sometimes call it DRBFM. You know, it, it, it's a, a fancy word of focusing on the changes. So when you, we, so you look at the historical information for things that haven't changed, but then you have to look at the things that have changed in the new product, new technology, there, if you don't have history, you do have to brainstorm. So, yeah, so it's a mixture of actual failures and potential failures, you know, in terms of driving out defects. Okay. Well, uh, Chad Kaimal, as usual, a CTO of, uh, of and founder of Omnex. Uh, we're going to be, he's going to be joining us actually in, uh, in a webinar that's going to be coming up uh, on this topic. So if you're interested in learning more on this topic, um, Omnex and us will be doing a webinar called From Percent Rejects to Parts Per Billion. And that's uh, next week on Tuesday, October 17th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. And Chad here is uh, going to be presenter and I will be the host. So keep an eye on your, e uh, your email inbox for an invitation. Uh, and actually, I believe there's also a link underneath the player page there that you can click on to go out to the registration page. So uh, Chad, we're looking forward to uh, talking about you, uh, uh, talking with you next week on this. Dirk, uh, I'll just leave with this thought some very important concepts of design and process reuse, which really reduces development costs, will be also one of the things we feature 
when we meet next time. Okay, and uh, your webinars are always really informative, yes. so encourage everybody to go out there and sign up. Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay, thanks, Chad. Thanks, Chad. We'll see you next week. Okay. Bye. Yeah, you, you hit that on the nail on the head. Uh, Chad's yeah. webinars are packed with They're information. They're packed, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but not, but not, you know, not, no, no. not in a way that you can't follow along. I mean, no, no. really, really no. very, very well organized. Yeah, yeah really, yeah. So, so check that out. You're gonna yeah. be interested in, in looking at that. All right, well, you know, we ran another interesting technological, uh, kind of technology-facing article this week. It was titled, New Research May Improve Communications During Natural Disasters. And it ran, you can see it right there. It ran in Monday's issue of the Quality <sighs> Digest newsletter. The piece was authored by Ben Snedeker. I hope I'm pronouncing Ben's name, Snedeker, Snedeker? Senator, Senator. probably. I uh, hope I'm pronouncing your name properly, Ben. Uh, he works for the Communications Office of the College of Computing at the Georgia Tech, uh, Georgia Institute of Technology, Georgia Tech, uh, which uh, really one of the great research institutes yeah, yeah. of the United States, Georgia Tech. Always a lot of interesting information comes out of their, their shop. And, you know, as we all know, of course, there's been an unusual number of, of natural disasters <laughs> here in North America over the past couple of months. I mean, from flooding and high winds due to Hurricane Harvey and Irma and Maria in Texas, Florida and Puerto Rico respectively to uh, earthquake. Earthquake caused devastation in Mexico City. Many of us have received, uh, and fires, fires the here fires in California. Oh, it's about <laughs> yeah. happening right now. I mean, we've received a not so gentle reminder that, uh, you know, mother nature is sometimes very, very cruel. Yep. Um, you have to live in that world and, and deal with it when these things happen. And, and you know, it, it, these events, they remind us really something else, I think as well that uh, you know our modern our high-tech society that we all live in is really kind of fragile and it's really reliant almost completely on electrical power yeah. right i mean the yeah. grid and when natural disasters knock out that grid that doesn't just mean no air conditioning no refrigeration no lights no tv I mean, all those things yeah. are inconvenient and dangerous and a problem but it also means no internet either without access to the internet of course it's much harder for emergency workers and first responders to uh, to share and yep. act on information um, that's gathered from those affected by hurricanes or earthquakes or tornadoes, floods, fires, or any other devastating acts of God. Uh, however, according to Snedeker's article, the use of edge computing, which he refers to here as fog computing, it's not fog computing, huh? wasn't what how I had heard of it, but okay. uh, edge computing, fog computing, there's some different names for it, can uh, really change the equation and assist emergency personnel uh, in communicating with each other and with those in need. Um, and we'll explain a little bit how this works. And, and Dirk, maybe you can help me with this. It's a little, a little technical. We'll see. Um, but we'll, we'll see if we can walk through it together. Now, okay. the practicality of edge computing, I've done a little research on this, has been recognized for at least the last several years, maybe the last decade, within the last decade. Um, and in the most basic of terms, this method optimizes data processing at the edge of networks, right? It means that sensing devices like surveillance cameras or consumer devices like tablets or cell phones can be networked, right, to communicate right. with one another even if internet uh, connectivity is constrained. So basically you can, I think, guess you can like build a network right. of these devices if you need to without having to rely on the cloud or okay. anything else. I, I think that's how I understand it. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure either. I, I mean, I'm, I'm only vaguely familiar with edge but computer, that, but I think that's the gist. That's yeah. the gist of it, yeah. right. So in other words, you can use these devices, cell phones, devices, right. Sensing devices like yeah. like um, the cameras and things to yeah. to kind of network and, together. and to network together. They don't necessarily have to go out over the broader network right. available from from all you over. Can they build they a could, network within uh, itself within itself to yeah. gather okay. information and communicate. Now, yeah. of course, that has big implications for first responders. I mean, think about it during emergencies because if power is down, typically communications are, are really severely compromised. So right. how do you get in touch with people who need help? How do you talk right. within yourself if you're on a team that's trying to help yeah. people? I mean, it's really a problem. Um, and responding to those in, in, that need help um, is, 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 again, it's problematic, but it's much more reliable or can be much more reliable with the help of an edge a computer network. Okay. And, and now, according to Georgia Tech computer science professor Kishore Ramachandran, I think that's how you pronounce that, I've got a couple of names here. On this Man. <laughs> Kishore Ramachandran, uh, he, he says, quote, uh, this capability will provide first responders and others with the level of situational awareness they need to make effective decisions in emergency situations. It's really interesting. Because yeah. you have to make decisions really fast. I mean, you have to know how high the waters are going, right. where people are, where your team is. Where the fires are where at. the fire yeah. is at, yeah. whatever it may be. You know, there's a lot that goes on in real time and you can't just go out with a plan because right. the plan changes in real time as the disaster is raging around you. It's right. a major problem. So it's important to note that there's other applications for edge computing other than just this one that Snedeker talks about in his, in his piece. Um, you know, remote communities and other places with limited you know, internet access can take advantage of sensing devices to share information, for instance. 
Um, in a large scale manufacturing environment is another example. Uh, typically that contains dozens, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands, right, of, right. of sensing devices. Uh, the sheer amount of data means that it can be processed closer to the sensors themselves and latency there, thereby can be reduced. And this really is a major leap forward in efficiency, which is exactly the kind of thing that manufacturers need. If they're going right. to be good manufacturers, they want to be great manufacturers, you need that kind of efficiency. And, you know, um, it's interesting, the reason why I know a little bit about this is that Ula Rulian talked about it at Hexagon Live okay. in June. Uh, C, uh, president, uh, president, He's CEO president of, of Hexagon, right. uh, big Hexagon, not just big Hexagon, Hexagon manufacturing, right, right, right. but Hexagon uh, as, as a pair company. He talked about edge computing, how they're experimenting with edge computing and yeah. Hexagon systems being able to use all that data to reduce latency and take advantage of, of these internet, these networked systems that right. you can have, which is much faster, I guess, much less latency, much less right. waste. Um, Again, you would know better than I, I think, in terms of how these systems work. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, f from just catching from the drist, gist of this, and I'll just kind of brainstorm and riff here, but uh, it sounds like what they're saying, and kind of my limited understanding, is that very often when you go out over the internet, you're connecting, you're jumping all over the place right. to get to a server that may be in Texas, and, yeah. we're, we're, and we're here in California. And when we say latency, I mean, we're talking about very small amount of well, time. Well, sometimes, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, small amounts, but uh, I, I think more critical is if that trunk gets cut off, mm -hmm. if, the, if the main pipe, let's say, to a server in Texas uh, gets cut off, then you're losing that data. And so edge computing has basically computers, you know, processors, uh, uh, databases, and so forth, spread all over the place, and you connect to the one that's closest right. to you or that's available to you. So even if you lose connection to something somewhere else, like they said, you may have a connectivity locally, mm -hmm. and if you have an edge computing center locally, then even if you're cut off from the rest of the world, so to speak, you're still somewhere in the ballpark. <laughs> right, in the ballpark. <laughs> you, wow. Do you hear that? I, I heard something. <laughs> it's like, I've got a creature in here. Uh, <laughs> Very happy creature. Jumps down on my back. It's all right. No, it's not a snake, no, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> sorry. It's just a little, little, little yeah. inside baseball here. Um, all right, so Dirk, we have a couple of minutes before the show ends. Um, <laughs> and I want to do a quick off script because we did, some of you know, we did our, our, our inaugural Virtual Test and Measurement Expo last week. And we, right. we looked at some interesting technologies from Farrow Technologies and, um, and Starrett. Start uh, kinemetric. Um, yeah. Now you did those demos. Now obviously you did them. You you were tactically involved with doing the demos. Those at home just kind of watch them. But they were I think I can say they were beautiful demos. I yeah. think they look great. I think it looked great. I think you got a really good perspective on what those those machines do. Um, but now going forward, and just to kind of you and I just to think about this, and again a little more inside baseball about our thought processes. I mean, do you think that that a demo like that again? You did it live here. People watched it live at home as, as it happened and they asked questions about it. Um, are there other ways we can do that? I mean, there are better ways we can do that and present those demos to people that would give them more information. Should they be shorter? Should they be longer? Should they be more in depth on certain things? Should they be, you know, what, well, what would you say some quality improvement we could do? Actually, to me, what actually, the best way to do them would be is if there was better interaction with the people who are watching I me. Mean, see, I, ideally what I would like to see happen is, is a situation where it's more real time. Right. Where, you know, somebody, you know, emails us or chats with us and they say, hey, can you... Look at that again. Can yeah. you look at that again? Can you, rather than run through a demo and hope that we've covered the, the, the high spots, is be able to, almost as if the, the, the audience was standing with us in the background and somebody s could say, hey, I didn't quite catch that. Or, or you know, can, can, can the camera look at the backside here? There was something I want to see. You know what I'm saying? Is yeah. where it's, it's more like it would be if you were an actual trade show and, and we were actually talking there and we could Sorry. actually I interact more real time yeah. with the presenter. To me, that would make it to me, that would make it better. Yeah, because we want to do more of these. I mean, we that's, that's, more, that's yeah. really the takeaway here is yeah. that we're going to do more of these kind of shows well, going forward. And, and see, that, because that's the problem is is when you do these demos, even when they're live, by the time the questions come in, right. you, you got, know, the you, demos you over, that, yeah. you know, and there, there's such a lag, and I don't know how to get make that more instantaneous. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I think it's just human nature mm. is I'm watching this and 10 minutes later I have a question, but sure. by now the demo's over, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I mean... Yeah, I mean, we're try so. what we're trying to do is we're trying to really replicate an experience as best we can where people can, can have an experience of seeing new products and they were all new technologies. 
right. for almost all brand new technologies. And, and I mean, we want you to be able to experience those as best as you can. So, you know, I guess just write us. I mean, that's one of the things we want to engage our audience yeah. in that. You know, if you, if you did watch our, our virtual test and measurement expo, you know, write us. Let us know what you thought of it at QDL, qualitydodgers.com, and we'll, uh, we'll try to improve our own process going forward on, on those shows. Yep. We're going to do more of those here in 2018. Yep. All right, well, that's our show. But before we go, of course, we want to uh, thank our sponsor. Uh, Mitutoyo Corporation is the world's largest provider of measurement and inspection solutions, offering the most complete selection of machines, sensors, systems, and services with a line encompassing CMMs, vision form and finish measuring machines, as well as precision tools and instruments and metrology data management software. Mitutoyo's nationwide network of metrology centers and support operations provides application, calibration, service repair, and educational programs to ensure that there are more than 6,000 metrology products will deliver measurement solutions for their customers. So for more information, visit online at www.minitoyo.com or click on the banner area just below or just to the right over there of this video player screen. That's right. And we want to uh, say our thanks as well to Chad Keimel of Omnex for joining us via Skype uh, and also the, the cat that walked through our, uh, walked through our studio. <laughs> I guess it's one. hungry. <laughs> that was a tough one for me, man. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Uh, don't forget uh, that Quality Digest and Omnex are presenting the webinar called From Percent Rejects to Parts Per Billion. Uh, the webinar happens next week on Tuesday, October 17th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, and Chad is presenting, and I'll be your host. So keep an eye on your email inbox for an invitation and register for the event if you haven't done that already. That's right. So we'll see you next week for that. We'll see you all next week again for a big, big episode of Quality Digest Live. Uh, you all have a good weekend. We'll see you soon. So long. Bye.